Praise the Lord. Well, we're on a theme at the moment on the whole area of giving, so let's go for it, eh? Why don't you open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6? And uh, <coughs> we're just talking on uh, money at the moment, and that's enough to get anyone to freeze up. <laughs> but uh, I'm not wanting to take any money from anyone. I'm wanting to help you. And uh, so today I want to share a message called Put God First. And I encourage you to uh, open your heart to let God speak to you today. We don't want any person to be under law. Law puts you under a sense of duty. I have to do this, I have to do that, or whatever. I want you to catch the heart and spirit of how you walk with God and enjoy a blessed life. And uh, we certainly have a blessed life. And, uh, and Matt, so we'll just pick it up. I want to pick it up where we were last week. Some weren't here last week. I want you just to hear just the, just the top headlines of what we touched on last week. Last week we spoke on the spirit of mammon. So let's just read the verse in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. No one. It's just impossible. You've got one or the other. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. No one can serve two masters. It's just impossible. You're either serving one or serving the other. You love one and hate the other. You're loyal to one and despise the other. Jesus is laying this out very clear. This is in his parable of the blessed life, his parable, or he's speaking uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's explaining the principles that lead to a life that is blessed. And so he begins to address an issue of finances. And I don't want to open up every part of it because I want to go somewhere else today. But let me just highlight there. Uh, the first thing to see is that there is a battle for your heart that goes on every day. There is a battle for our heart. Every day I have a struggle and a battle for the loyalty of my heart. And you do too. There's no one is immune to it. There is, we live in the world. The world's a fallen world. It lives, it, it's under the rule of principalities and powers. So pressure from our culture comes on all of us. There's no one is exempt. No one is exempt. We all face pressure. And so there's a battle for loyalty on your heart. And the Bible is very clear. It contrasts the word God and mammon. So it's talking God is a spirit. Mammon is also a spirit. It's a spiritual power that works and operates behind money and wealth and riches in the world. It's a spirit being. It's a spiritual power. And you, as we're well aware, that, that, that the things in the world, whoever has a lot of money or has the accumulation of wanting, seems to have tremendous power. But money itself, as we saw last week, has no power. It's the spirit behind it that has the power. Power to rule you or power to, to rule your life and cause you to have many difficulties. So one of the things we know from simple things about deliverance is that if you are under the influence of a spirit, it will be talking to you continually. So if you're under the influence of the spirit of mammon, it will talk to you. Now, it doesn't sort of turn up and say, I'm an evil demon and I'm talking to you. It, it's just you have your mind gets full of thoughts. And if you listen to those thoughts, they can become so familiar and so natural to you that they seem quite reasonable. But if a person is under the influence of the spirit of mammon, then there'll be a number of things. Uh, first, it will speak to you. It'll speak to you, there's not enough. I need a bit more. It'll always be talking to you. Uh, and, and it'll be talking about money and the concern about money, or they're just after my money, or people want my money, or, or I haven't got enough money. Uh, it'll promise you, if you just got a little bit more, you'll be really secure. If you just got set up, uh, you'd be right. If you had enough money, then uh, people would really notice you. So it talks all the time, and it makes promises it never delivers on. I've seen too many rich people who have miserable lives to believe that money can really make your life happy. It just can't. God can make you happy. Money can't. Money is just, it's just a piece of paper. It's some numbers in the bank. It cannot make your life happy. Uh, what it does instead is it tends to create problems. I remember going to uh, a, a man in Taiwan, and uh, he was one of the wealthiest men I've ever met in my life. Uh, I never asked the amount, but he, he owned banks <laughs> and railroads. <laughs> and uh, he was extremely wealthy. He had guards everywhere he went. He couldn't even come to church because uh, it's just such a drama, him coming to church with armed guards around him all the time. He was in danger of kidnapping, and his family were in danger of kidnapping, so they had to live with security. So the first thing I saw when I go in the door is an armed guard who checks me out before I can go. I passed three guys with guns before I got to the guy. 
and then we sat and talked and everything around him was very nice. And this guy's now become a Christian, but he's very, very young in his faith. And so we got talking about his life. And he said to me, well, a lot of my friends don't see the need to go to church because they see churches for needy people. I said to him, well, that's very true. I said, people come because they recognize their need for Jesus Christ and they gather to be built and to, to express his life. But I said, uh, I said, you actually have a need you're not aware of. He said, what's that? He was quite surprised. And I said, well, I look around and I see all the wealth you have. And I said, no one in their lifetime could spend it all. So here's the need. Number one need you have is you have no purpose for your life. And so therefore money controls your life. So I said, I'm picking that most nights you won't sleep very well and you'll have a lot of anxiety and fear because you'll be fearful about losing all you've got. And not only that, you won't trust the people around you because you'll never know whether they're interested in you or your money. And he was shocked. He says, exactly true. I continually have trouble sleeping. And uh, then I had a word of knowledge for his wife and I looked at her and the Lord just dropped the vision into me. And I, I saw a vision of this, uh, this beautiful bird, like, a, like on these parakeets, like beautiful colors and whatever, but inside a cage. I said, you're a beautiful person, but you're trapped in a cage. And she began to break down and weep. And in front of her astonished husband, she broke down and wept. She said, I hate all of this stuff. It controls my life. How about that? How about that? You thought they were all happy. <laughs> so it was quite a shock. He was shocked. So she got delivered, and he got prayed for. He got delivered. Last time I saw, there was a complete difference in how they were handling themselves. So money definitely has a spirit. And so, uh, uh, so money uh, carries a spirit with it. And uh, if uh, the spirit of mammon is uh, pushing against you, you'll feel fear and anxiety over money. Because notice straight away after this that Jesus talks about not worrying. So in the context of talking about money, he then talks about worry and anxiety and fear. And if anything creates anxiety and fear and dread in people, it's the issue of finances because we don't manage them well. We don't know how to get them so that they're blessed finances. And uh, so we see that. And then finally, the thing about money or mammon, sorry, mammon is a spirit that desires to make you a slave and to take the place of God in your life. You have to understand you're dealing with spiritual entities and you're dealing with heart issues. And so... It's not just a matter about giving or doing this or doing that. It is a battle for your heart so you can be free. God wants you to be free from fear, free from dread and anxiety around the money area and to live in a place of blessing and a place of joy. And so uh, associated spirits that go along with the spirit of mammon is the spirit of pride. Pride says, I've got it all myself. I've worked hard. I deserve it. It gives no honor to God. Uh, pride also says, uh, I paid this much for it and kind of flakes what everything's worth, uh, and a spirit of poverty. Spirit of poverty, you can have it with your rich or poor, but a spirit of poverty will keep telling you, is not enough, there's not enough, there's not enough. And a spirit of poverty around your life, you can't even enjoy what you do have. So if someone says, well, how much did you pay for that? Oh, nothing much, I just got it down the road at this price. And you can't even just celebrate. Actually, God is generous and gives us all things to richly enjoy. How about that? God gives us all things richly to enjoy. So whatever you've got, enjoy it. But you can't enjoy it when you're under the power of a spirit. And we saw last week that money was not evil. It's actually the love and the spirit that gets behind it. Now let's just flow down through here. Jesus talks about not being worried. I say to you, do not worry. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more value than them? So let's pick that thought up. In that we see that God doesn't require sowing and reaping to be good to you. Many Christians think, if I just give this to God, then he'll have to do this to me. This is the deal. That it doesn't work like that in the kingdom of God. Or if I sow, then I'm certain to reap. God will have to make sure I get something back. Listen, God doesn't operate that way. God is generous. He gives, he says, he gives to the birds and they don't sow at all. God is just generous. This is hard for us to get a hold of. God is extravagantly generous. He is not mean. He does not withhold. It's the devil who withholds. The devil is the thief. It's the devil who's the robber. It's the devil who's the poor one. God is extravagantly generous in every aspect of it. It's his nature to be extravagant and generous. So he points it out here. Don't be anxious. God is so generous to the birds and you're much more value than a bird. See? And then he goes on and he said... Uh, 
We'll go down. He said, don't worry, verse 31. He says, don't worry, saying, what do we eat? What are we going to drink? What do we wear? For the, after these, all the Gentiles seek. And your father knows you need these things. So he says, don't get anxious about how you're going to meet daily living requirements. God knows what you need. He said, the world worries like that. If you're a believer, God has a blessed life where you don't live in anxiety and dread and fear about your provision. God has become your provider. You're released from the burden of having to make it all happen and to work under this dreaded spirit, this heavy taskmaster that drives and hurts people. We're called to live under the influence of the Spirit of God, under the blessing of God in our financial and and material area of our life. So notice that then it says, but... It says what you should do. So it says, don't be anxious. So it talks about, first, here's the conflict. Something is competing for your heart. Two, don't get anxious, because if you're anxious, you're not in the place of freedom. And then three, it says, here's what you do do. Put the Lord first. Nothing could be clearer. Seek first the kingdom of God, or seek God's rule or order around your life and every aspect of it, and seek the way to live or a right way before God to live, he said, then everything else will add to you. Now, that's an extraordinary promise. Of course, it's not one that so many people see happen because it requires of us prioritizing God in our heart. It says, seek first, not seek second or third or add on a bit to God. It's not add on God. I'll run my life and add God on. That's not what brings adding into your life. The adding comes into your life. Adding means God's power or God's blessing comes on your life and around your life and things start to attract into you that before you had to work and stress and sweat to get. See, and so it says, seek first the kingdom of God. So I want to look at this area of putting God first, giving God the first place, giving God the first place, not the second or third, or a little add-on. Let's have a look now. I want to just touch on some scriptures here and open up some things. In Exodus chapter 13, Exodus 13, and you'll see this putting God first, or this area of first, first fruit or first in your life, you'll see this goes right through the Bible. So what do I need to do with my money? Well, I need to do two things at least. Number one, I need to give God the first, and two, I need to steward or manage the rest. And mismanagement is no substitute, or you can't just expect God to, uh, to, to meet everything if you won't manage your part of it properly. So notice here, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. Consecrate or set apart the firstborn. Look at it in verse 12. You shall set apart to the Lord all that opens the womb, Every firstborn that comes from every animal you have, male shall be the Lord. Every firstborn of a donkey shall redeem with a lamb. If you don't redeem it, then it's, you'll break its neck and it'll be sacrificed. The firstborn of your men among your sons you shall redeem. See? And so it should be when, you're, when your son asks you in the time to come saying, what is this? Or in other words, why are you managing your money like this? Why are you managing your resources like this? You'll say... It's because by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt and out of bondage. So notice even here at this first introduction of the law of first fruits or the first, giving the first to God, it says very clearly two things. Number one, that we should give the first portion to God. And number two, it comes because we're grateful for what he has done. This is not a matter of law or obligation or duty. This is an issue of gratitude. So when your children ask you, why is it you manage your finances by giving the first portion to the Lord? You say, because God delivered me out of bondage. I used to live in the world in anxiety and debt and dread. I used to live coveting. I used to live in bondage of fear. I had all kinds of things going on. My money was in a mess. Now God has delivered me out of all of that bondage. Now I'm in a place of blessing. And here's why I'm in a blessing. I put the Lord first. See, this is a principle for how families should govern their finances. So notice this. It said you have to set apart the firstborn of the womb. Now, okay, so suppose I've got two sheep, ram and a sheep. And so here we are. I've got them, finally got them, and now I have the first lamb. Now, this is the way we would think. 
I will wait till I have 10 lambs and I'll give one to the Lord. And what the Bible says is, no, the very first one, you give that to the Lord. Now, here's the question that immediately would come if you're under the power of mammon. What if the you fails to bring forth any more lambs? What if it damages itself when it has that firstborn and can't produce any more lambs? Where will I be then? I know what I need to do. I'll keep this one and I'll wait till I've got 10 and I'll give the 10th one to the Lord. That is not giving the first. That is not giving the first to the Lord. So you notice here an act of faith is required. The act of faith is this. I will give the first and I expect all the rest to be really blessed. And you'll find consistently whenever it talks about giving the first to the Lord, the purpose of it is to redeem all the rest so that the rest is blessed. That's the hard thing is to think that way because we don't tend to think that way at all. We think, well, I'll wait till I've got a few more, then I'll do it. But this is the principle. When we offer the first to God, it puts all the rest under blessing. That's it in a nutshell. So when you offer the first to God, all the rest of what you have is now blessed. And I'll show you some scriptures related to that, but if you would just take away uh, this one thought, if I give my first to God, then the rest is blessed. And there's a blessing on it. What does that mean? It means I don't suffer the devouring by lots of things going wrong that others suffer. I have opportunities come that others don't have. It's somehow God makes the nine-tenths go further than the ten-tenths worth. Now, when you're living in bondage, if you can barely make it on ten-tenths, then surely in your mind you'll think, nine-tenths, I'm going to fall over. What he's saying here is this. He said, you have to act in faith. Your money is under the power of a spirit. Put it in God's hands. Okay, here it is. I give it all to you, God. He says, no, 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 no. I only require the first portion. You give me the first portion, all the rest is under blessing. And this principle follows everywhere. Let's just look at a few places. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. God in his generosity gave his firstborn. Jesus Christ was called the Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God. He was called the firstborn from the dead. So Jesus Christ, so God actually modeled this. God gave, or he, he gave of his son. He gave generously and extravagantly. And the result is, now get this, see? He gave his son who's holy and spotless and clean. See, his son was, it was, was came, Jesus came to the earth, born of a human body. Now, here's the deal. We are unclean in sin. But God's offering of his firstborn makes all of us clean. So in other words, the blessing comes on all of humanity because the first is given. Jesus never had his life taken from him. He gave his life. And what you'll find is there's no duty or taking or anything right through the Bible when it comes around this area of this first portion to God. It's always an issue of faith, of trusting that God's principles will work. And you see it from one end to the other. You notice even in the Garden of Eden, God gave them plenty, but he said, this one belongs to me. You can't touch that one. Touch that one and you die. The first is always something God says belongs to him. And so I don't have to give him everything to prove that he's Lord of my life. What I need to do is to show he's my Lord by actually taking the first portion and giving it to him. Now, he may ask me to give at various times, and he has done in all kinds of ways, but if the first is in his hands, then the rest is blessed. The big deal is to put the first in his hands. See, have a look in uh, Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus 27. Leviticus 27. You're all very happy today. I'm unhappy. There's something of pressure comes around every time you try and talk about this area. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, and verse uh, 30, all the tithe of the land, all, it's all the tithe of the land, where the seed of the land uh, or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It's holy to the Lord. So notice what God's saying. And he's saying to people that he's provided for abundantly. He's given them all this wealth. All the, and he's saying, now here it is. He said, the, the first portion or the tithe belongs to me. So it belongs to God. Now, here's an interesting thing. If my finance resources and life is under God, then I show it by giving the tenth. When I give him the tenth, the rest is under the blessing. If I withhold the, the, the tenth, I'm withholding what belongs to God. See, I used to think when I started off giving a tithe and I started to give 
the tithe, I thought it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. That's because I was under a spirit of bondage. After I gave for a while, I realized, actually, this is no big deal at all. I can't outgive God. How can I actually possibly show him that I really honor him and love him and value him? Well, this is the way. I just give him a portion of what I have. And uh, we have done that faithfully since we first heard about this. So notice this, that the first portion determines the rest. Have a look at this in Romans 11 and verse 16. First, uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 16. The first, the nature of the first portion determines the rest. So here it is, Romans 11 verse 16. It says this, if the first is holy, then the lump is holy. If the root is holy, so are all the branches. Now, that's what it's saying. If the first fruit is holy, then the root is holy or the rest of it is holy. Now, we just saw that God has spoken to his people. And he, said, now all the, he said, out of all the tithe, of all the trees, because they're an agricultural land, he said, of all the tithe, it all belongs to the tithe belongs to the Lord, and it's holy. Now, I'm going to show you something. Your money can be holy or cursed. And it all depends on the place you give God in your money. Quite simple. So notice he says, the tithe is holy to the Lord. In other words, it is sanctified. We were singing that this morning, holy to the Lord. So the tithe is holy to the Lord. And the Bible says, if the first fruits is holy, all the rest is holy. All the rest is blessed. So the principle is always the same. When you give your first to the Lord, the rest is always blessed. The blessing of God comes upon it. So Let's have a look at a couple of things related to it. So the first portion determines the nature of the rest. Now, let's go and have a look in Joshua chapter 6. In Joshua chapter 6, they went in to take the promised land. And we, as believers, would think of the promised land as being the promises of God, the blessings of God. The promised land was a land of promise. It was a land that came by promise, not by working hard. They had their part in it. Now, notice what God says when they go in there. And the first city they come to is Jericho. And when they come to Jericho, God says an interesting thing. He says about Jericho, he says, verse 18 of chapter 6 in Joshua, by all means, abstain from the accursed thing, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. All the silver, gold, and bronze, vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord or devoted to the Lord. They will come into the treasury of the Lord. Now notice you see two words there, devoted to God and cursed. You can't have them both, one or the other. So he's saying, this city Jericho, he said, I want you to touch none of it. He said, I want you to conquer the city. And when you conquer the city, whatever wealth you find there, it comes into the house of the Lord. It, it is the Lord's. It is the first fruits. It's the first portion. Now, you can understand it's the same deal with the sheep. I've got all these battles I'm going to have to fight to conquer all these cities. And here's the first city. And now I start to see gold and silver. Now, maybe we're not going to win so much in the other cities. You know, there's a lot in this first city. Maybe we could just wait until we've conquered three or four cities, and then we'll take our portion and give it to the Lord then. We'll wait and sort of see how this goes. No, he required them by faith. He said, the first belongs to me. So he required them by faith to take what was the first and give it to him and believe that if they did that, the rest would all be blessed. Now, so he says, so that first thing, the first, the first portion, the tithe or whatever it is that belongs to the Lord, it's either belongs to the Lord and it's devoted or it's stolen from the Lord and it's a curse. So notice what happens here in, in, uh, in Joshua chapter 7. Now, the children of Israel committed a trespass concerning the accursed things or devoted things, for Achan took of the devoted things or the accursed things and the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So you notice now, uh, before... Before he took it, it was devoted to the Lord. After he took it, it was a cursed object. Now, this is extraordinary. That means I, I can have an object. Let me take this bottle here. So God says, you give me the bottle, the first thing, and there's lots of water coming after this. I look at it and think, well, I'm pretty thirsty. I wouldn't mind that, you know. I've been fighting all these battles. I've got to fight this war, and here's all this treasure. I wouldn't mind that, you know. It would be quite good for me to have that. So here it is. I've got to decide what to do. The choice is always mine. So the choice is either I give it to God, in which case it's devoted, or I keep it, in which case it's cursed. Isn't that interesting? That's what he's saying. He said, you give it to me, it's devoted, and blessing comes on the rest. You hold it back, it's cursed. And now everything else is cursed. And so the next thing happened was they had no power to stand in the battle. They were defeated by an inferior army at their next battle. And God's trying to teach us 
that behind the natural there is a spiritual power. It wasn't that the army was any less or that they had no less weapons or anything like that. The problem was they lacked power. When, they held, when Achan held back the thing that was devoted to God and kept it for himself, he and everyone around him no longer had power to overcome. The power to overcome come, depended on the devoted thing belonging to the Lord. Now, it's the same thing with our finances and our resources. If we keep back from God what is owing to him, it turns from being devoted to him to being a, a curse for us. Or putting it in a simple way, very simple like this. When I give my first portion to the Lord, it ensures blessing on the rest. If I hold it back, I'm under the power of mammon. Now, why did this guy go for it? Have a look. If you follow, the Bible even makes it clear why he took it. If you go around in, in, Je, in Joshua chapter 7 and go down there to verse, uh, they finally found him out. And verse um, 20 said, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment uh, of uh, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, here it is. I coveted them. I took and I hid and the Bible says in the New Testament that coveting is idolatry. So what happened is this. He went in, he fought the battle. And when he fought the battle and they conquered the city, he came into a place where there's this garments and silver and gold. And he looked at it. Now, the instructions were clear. This belongs to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. But he looked at it and he thought, oh, oh, oh man, I could do with these. This is good. He kept it for himself. He coveted what belonged to God. And so the, the sin of coveting or greed indicates he was under the power of the spirit of mammon. Mammon is a spirit that moves in greed. You just can't have enough. And so the, a problem came. So notice this. Before he took it, it's devoted. After he took it, it's cursed. Before, 100% of it. Here's the deal. It, this is how it seems to me to work. I can have, I have 100% of everything I have, and it's all under a cursing and under the power of the spirit of mammon or I can have 90% of what I have, and it's blessed. And I think, and I have found from years of experience, the 90% with blessing is better than the 100% with trouble. It's true. And I know at times uh, it has been very difficult to uphold that commitment, but it was always about an issue of the heart. Will I put God first and trust him? Now, I want to identify some core heart issues behind this. Now, there's probably more than this, uh, but I want to just pick up four very simple heart issues that lie behind giving the first portion to the Lord. And they, they're quite simple. Remember, Jesus said, the battle is won for your heart. There's a spirit that is, is seeking to conquer your heart. So here we go. Here they are. Number one, the first one is the principle of honor. The principle of honor. The word in the Bible, in the word honor means to value to place a weight on something. So will I honor God and place value on his willingness and ability to bless me? What value will I put on that? See? So will I honor God and put him first in my finances? What value do I place on God in the issue of managing my money? That's what it boils down to. And uh, very similar in Proverbs 3, verse 19, it says, honor the Lord with all your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. Now, the way we have done it is whenever we've, whatever we have done, we've always considered God's best and how we would best advance his kingdom. So when we come to buy a house, it was never about what would look good or be nice or in the right area. It was always what would help advance the kingdom of God. What can we, what kind of house do we need to have that would enable us to have people in and out, and show hospitality. There's always going to be a fact. It was never just about whether we could have a family. It was always about what God had for us. We've always tried to put him first around all these different kinds of areas, and God's kept us from all kinds of difficulties and brought us into all kinds of blessing around this that we could never have imagined. It just, I can't imagine how. I don't even understand how it happens that we have what we have now. I don't understand. It can only be understood by blessing. There's no tangible or visible sign that we've been able to progress as we have, it is the blessing of God that's done it. And so I can only say we're blessed. We're blessed. 
I can't say I'm that smart on all this issue. The second area is the area of faith. The area of faith. Will I trust God uh, eh, that he is a generous provider? Will I trust him he will generously provide for my life? Think about that. It's an issue of faith. Will I trust him by giving my first portion to him? Now think about this. How old was Abraham when Abraham had his first son? About 100, wasn't he? His wife was probably in her 90s. Okay. Now remember, he got impatient waiting for that first son, and then finally he got the son. Uh, he, got, he, got a, he, got a, he got a mess up with Ishmael, and then he still got to wait for the promise. So finally the promise comes, he's got the first son. Now you've got to understand, if you're 100 and your wife is nearly 100, getting any son is a miracle. It is, and now, now, and this is the son of promise. This is the son he loved. Now in Genesis 22, God says, take the son that you love and offer him up to me. No, how could this be? She's so old. What if she doesn't have any more children? Can, can you understand that the same thing we talked about with the sheep and, and with, uh, with the Joshua, with the, it's exactly the same deal. Is she able to have any more? It's not like, wait, hey God, look, I tell you what, can we put this deal off? Wait till I've got a few more in the family and then we'll bring number 10 and give number 10 to you. No, it was an issue. Do you trust me that the promise stands regardless of whether Isaac is here or not. He had the promise before he had Isaac. And when he offered up Isaac, he knew he still had the promise. God cannot lie. This is why he's called a man of faith. Because he trusted God over this issue. That if he offered God his first and his best that he loved, then God would somehow restore him, raise him up, but God would fulfill the promise that he'd be a father of nations. It's an issue of faith. An issue of, and that's why he's called the father of faith, because he made what's almost an ultimate sacrifice, and in doing so showed us just the great love that God had. Here's the third area. Here's the third area. Gratitude. 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 So one is honor, placing value on God. Second is faith, trusting that he can actually provide better than I can provide for myself. And if I put him first, I can then expect the blessings on everything that I do. The third thing is great gratitude. Am I grateful to God for all he's given me? How grateful am I? Now, think about this. Abraham, in Genesis 14, remember Abraham had been blessed and become very wealthy, and he came after a great battle where he rescued his nephew Lot, and he came and he met with Melchizedek, the high priest. And the Bible says he gave him a tithe of everything. Now, I don't know how many, because most of you know that verse there. He gave him a tithe. Now, he wasn't required to. He gave it as an issue of gratitude. Now, get this. Immediately, the king of Sodom came to him. He said, listen, you can have all the goods, but give me the people. And he said this. He said, I will not take anything of yours lest you say you got me rich. I want my total blessing and source to be in the Lord. Now, it's, it's no coincidence that at the point where he gave this offering to the Lord, there was a choice between negotiating with the king of Sodom or the spirit of Mammon or dealing with Melchizedek, which is a type or a picture of Jesus Christ. Will I put God first or will I put Mammon first? He said, no way. I'll enter no deals with you. I want to put God first. He will be the source of my supply. So again, notice that the motivation is one of gratitude. Now, how much would you pay to get your soul out of hell? Put it simply. What would you put on the line if you had a vision of hell and you saw what it would involve for eternity? What would you be willing to give up in order to buy freedom from that? The answer is you put everything on the line. You put everything on the line. However, we don't need to. We only need to put one tenth. And then we're not buying anything. We're actually saying, God, it was too expensive to save me. You have saved me. You've given your son to save me. The least I can do is acknowledge with gratitude your generosity and honor you and trust you and give to you. It's very, very simple, isn't it? And you find even in the New Testament, this is the last one here, it has to be of a willing mind, a willing mind. And so the last thing is, will you give out of a willing heart or will you give out a duty and obligation? Oh, I have to do this. We have never in this church ever said, you have to tithe. I've always avoided saying anything like that. Now, do I believe that we should tithe? Of course I do. 
We do, and we do it diligently and regularly, and we give and have offerings and, and grateful light for all kinds of things uh, ourselves personally. But the thing is, I don't want anyone to come under the law. It has to be of a willing heart. When they came to offer for the building of the, uh, of the, uh, of the tabernacle, the first question God says, every person is of a willing heart. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church and, uh, in 2 Corinthians 8. He says that it's required, first of all, a willing heart. So there's no compulsion, no arm bending, no, no twisting, no manipulation, no pressure. It's a willing heart. Now, a willing heart comes because you have revelation that God is good and generous and I want to honor him. I'm so grateful to him. And when I do that and give him that, it's now an issue of honor and faith. And this is what brings the blessing on the rest. Now, if I'm going to give God the first, it needs to be the first. It comes right off the top. And it's not at the end when everything else is paid. It's the first. When Jesus spoke to the Pharisees in, in, in Matthew 23, 23, he said to them, you all tithe and you tithe off this and this and this and this. He said, these things you ought to have done, but the weightier or bigger matter and bigger issues of justice and mercy and faith, you've forgotten about those altogether. You got legalistic about tithing every carrot. One carrot and ten goes to God. He said, that's where you got all to that kind of legalism. And he said, what you've missed is the bigger issues of justice, treating people rightly, mercy, showing people kindness and faith, trusting God. Those are the biggies. Those are the big issues. So I need to make a decision then what I'm going to do. I do not want to live under pressure, stress, and bondage. I must make a decision to bring my finances out of this place of pressure under the spirit world and into a place of an open heaven with blessing. And God says that very clearly in Malachi. He said, why don't you just check me out on this one? He said, see that I won't open up the windows of heaven. Bring, bring what you have into the storehouse. So I want to encourage us in this. Go through the scriptures yourself. Search the scriptures yourself. And then begin to ask yourself, I wonder what is happening in my financial world. Remember, I'm required first to honor God with the first part, and then I have to manage the rest. And we're not dealing with how to manage the rest at the moment. We're just looking at bringing the whole financial area under God. And the first part of it is to take my first portion and give it to the Lord, to take my tenth and to take it off the top and give it into the house of God. That's where it goes. Now, people have got all kinds of ideas and they do all sorts of things, but it's not what the Bible says. Listen, the tithe or the first fruit is the only part that's got the power to redeem the rest. I need to make sure I treat it as a holy thing and I need to put it where God says to put it. That then I can believe consistently for the best. So I, I believe God wants to help us in this area and I'm speaking this in order to bring just some clarity around our heart so we actually see how to respond out of a good heart. Now, the world criticized the church, all this thing on tithing. But let me just finish you with this. I was watching a program on Oprah. Oprah. I don't watch Oprah very often. And I watched this particular one, and I was absolutely astonished what I heard. They had a special woman on. She had these special guests come on. And the special guest she come on was a financial manager who helped people who were in distress and debt to get out of their distress and debt. And so they had a few people, of course, who had credit cards maxed up to the maximum height and everything like this. And they were totally in bondage. And they got this a woman to come, and she spoke with her. And, uh, they just, and they got people to describe their problems. And she said, well, what would you advise them? She said, well, it's really quite simple. He said, they need to tithe. Now, she was not a saved person. She's not a Christian person. She said, I've done a study of money and wealth and people who have it and people who don't. He said, I've noticed something. Uh, quite interesting when I've observed all these different people. He said, I've studied the people who got it, people who haven't. He said, I've noticed that for some people, money is attracted into them. He said, I've noticed for other people, money seems to be repelled away from them. And when it's repelled away from them, they seem to go from difficulty to difficulty to difficulty, but the others seem to just go from blessing to blessing to blessing. No, you can't figure out. He said, so I've realized that there's a power involved. And he says, either you have power over money or money has power over you. And she said, I've also learned that the only way that you can know whether you have power over money is if you can open your hand and give. And I've known, and she said, consistently I've seen that some of the wealthiest people also give no less than 10%. They just practice it as a part of maintaining power over money. Most people, money's got power over them and they're in fear of it. So the moment it comes to giving anything to anyone, 
immediately there's a conflict in the heart. And he's saying that actually generosity or giving is the only way you can demonstrate and maintain your power over money. Now, that's a secular person in a secular program talking about the whole issue of money and a power behind money. She couldn't give the language we can give, didn't have the Bible connections with it, but did understand this, that there is a power behind it. And that the only way I can be free of that is if I start to learn how to open my hand and to direct giving. And we see from reading the Bible that if I put the first fruits to God, then I have blessing come around the rest. Things start to come towards me instead of going away from me. I come into a place where there's a river of blessing. Another time I want to talk about generosity, which uh, was touched on today, the whole area of having a generous spirit, which is part, this is the Christian spirit, a generous spirit. But I want to just ask you this to consider, where am I in this whole area? Am I in problems? Am I giving God the honor and the glory? Let's just close our eyes right now. Just close our eyes. You know, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you know, one of the greatest things to understand is the generosity of God. I know we've talked a little bit about finances, but we're talking about coming into a blessed life. And the first step of coming to a blessed life has nothing to do with money. It has to acknowledge Jesus Christ. God gave his son to love you and bless you and to bring you out of sin. Jesus died on the cross to redeem you from sin. He gave his life as the offering so you could become clean and blessed. But what requires is that you identify with that and that Jesus becomes your offering. Instead of trying hard to be a better person, you come to the cross and say, Jesus, I accept what you have done on my behalf. This is my offering on my behalf. And I thank you my life is sanctified, made whole, and I'm free from sin because you are my first fruits. You are my offering. I take what you have done and I say, God, accept this offering of Jesus Christ. What an amazing deal, isn't it? Isn't this astonishing? What a great thing. And the first step, of course, you need to make a decision to receive Jesus. Is there anyone here today right at that place? I'd love you to open your heart and just say, Tonight, today I want to receive Jesus Christ. I'd just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to come to Jesus today. I want to give my life to Jesus. Any person here today right at that place, just raise your hand. So I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to become a Christian. Is there anyone here today? Most important decision. God bless you, sir. I see that hand. Anyone else? Anyone else here today? Great decision you're about to make. Great decision going on in your heart right now. Is there anyone else? I see their hand over there. God bless you, dear. Fantastic. What a great decision. Is there anyone else? You know, God loves you. How much more could he give you? He doesn't want, he doesn't want you to suffer. He wants you to be blessed. And the first step is to receive what Jesus did for you and invite him to come into your heart. Is there anyone else? Just last call. Anyone else? I guess what we're going to do right now, just listen. In a moment, on the count of three, we'll all stand together and we're going to rejoice because God in heaven rejoices when a sinner comes to Christ. And this is what I'd like the two people put your hand up. If you could make your way to the front, if you brought someone with you, they can come up with you. Just stand in a row facing me. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer to open your heart to receive Jesus. We'll all pray it. And uh, so it's going to be such a simple thing. And I'll pray for God's blessing to come on your life. And uh, we're going to rejoice with you today in this great decision. Church, one, two, three, let's stand. Let's give them a clap. Young man over here, woman over here, like to come to you. Please come. Come on, let's give them a great clap. Fantastic. God bless you, sir. God bless you, man. Jesus loves you. Okay, come on, dear, come on. God bless you. What's your name? Mark and Donna. Donna. Mark and Donna. Thank you. And Deborah too. God bless you. Why don't you come and stand on the stand next to your husband? Okay, come around. We'll get you around the right way. There we go. That's we've got to make sure I've got the right one. Hey, that's fantastic. Okay, and you are your friend. Have you come along to your mum? How wonderful, mum. Great to have you here. Okay, well we'll all hold hands together. Might as well do that, eh? And church, <clears throat> let's reach your hands out to them and let's all pray this simple prayer together. Prayer is just talking to God. You see, when we talk to him, he'll hear you. He'll hear us when we talk. Let's just follow us in this prayer. All just listen to the words and pray this prayer, reaching out to give your life to Jesus. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for accepting me. 
Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I turn away from all my sin today. I receive you as my Savior. I give you my life today. I receive your Spirit into my heart. And today before heaven and earth, I declare Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord and my friend forever. I am blessed. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Father, I just thank you for each one here today. I just want to pray for blessing to come on you. God loves you. He understands the terrible pain that you have